Thanks. Uh, so today I will be talking about regulating the metaverse. Um, and I will get into some very, very specific issues of, uh, of what the problems are, what the risks are, and what we could potentially do. Um, I'm going to start off by giving just a little background about myself, uh, because I'm going to, I, I write a lot about the dangers of the metaverse. People think uh, maybe I'm against the metaverse. It's actually the exact opposite. I'm a, I'm a huge proponent. Uh, and in fact, I've been involved for 30 years since the early days of VR. Uh, I started working in 1991 as a researcher at Stanford and NASA on, uh, on virtual reality. Uh, my early work was on uh, early headsets, early vision systems. And, and I was working on um, interocular distance, the distance between your eyes, optimizing depth perception. It was uh, really exciting during the early days. Um, I spent a lot of time coding. And, and I came away from that experience convinced that virtual reality uh, would one day change the world. I also came away feeling like uh, virtual reality was a little bit isolating and enclosing. And what I really wanted to do was take that technology and just splash it all over the real world. And this was before uh, the phrase augmented reality existed. And so I pitched uh, the idea to the US Air Force. And, uh, and they gave me a, a fellowship in 1992 to build, uh, this, is, uh, this is me at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, uh, building what uh, became called the Virtual Fixtures Platform. It is uh, really the first augmented reality system that allowed people to reach out and interact with real and virtual objects. Uh, you can see I'm wearing this big exoskeleton because it wasn't just sight and sound, it was touch. People could actually feel real objects and virtual objects. That too was an amazing experience. What was actually most important to me was that I ran a lot of tests with human subjects. And so they would climb into this exoskeleton, they would do uh, experiences, they would come out, and then every single one of them would say, one day this is, you know, this is going to be the technology that changes the world, that uh, virtual reality, augmented reality is going to be everywhere. Uh, I believed them. This was 30 years ago. And uh, I founded a Immersion Corporation, actually uh, here in San Jose, 30 years ago, as one of the early virtual reality companies. Uh, we developed a lot of the early products, first products that really went to real markets. We built the first uh, virtual reality medical simulators, uh, sold to medical schools, started selling those in 1995, if you can believe, sold those for decades. Actually, they still sell the products today. Uh, we brought the company public in 1999, and it's actually still around today, 30 years later. It's probably the oldest VR company from the, the early days. Uh, I left and in 2004 founded an augmented reality company, uh, Outland Research. Uh, we developed technologies for spatial computing. Uh, it was acquired by Google in, I think, 2011, 2012. And now I, uh, I'm the CEO of Unanimous AI, a company I founded that's an, an artificial intelligence company focused on connecting people together in shared environments to amplify their group intelligence. Uh, we just had an announcement here uh, on uh, two days ago, where uh, we announced that we have a partnership with uh, a company called Agora World to bring this technology into the metaverse to enable groups to amplify their intelligence. That's not what I'm going to be talking about. I'm going to be talking about the metaverse in general, but really want to express that for 30 years, I've been really excited about the potential of the metaverse, the potential of these technologies. Uh, but for the last 10 years, I've started to get pretty worried about the risks. The risks, because I could see them coming and they're not being talked about at the level that they deserve. And, um, and so that's what I'm going to talk about today. First, I just want to take a moment to say, well, what is the metaverse? And I say that because from a regulatory perspective, it's worth having a, a clear definition of what we're talking about. Uh, I like to talk about the metaverse at the broadest level as the societal transition from flat media viewed in the third person to immersive media experienced in the first person. And that's a really big deal. It's a big deal because it's a, tra it's a transformation of the user from the observer on the outside to a participant on the inside. And it will transform computing. I really believe that. It will transform society. I really believe that. And I believe that we're now, you know, having been doing this for 30 years, I believe we're now in the last 10 years. 10 years from now, we will see a really different world uh, impacted by the metaverse. I think it's important from a regulatory perspective to consider that there's really two types of metaverse that we should be talking about. One is the fully virtual world, a world where people are avatars. I would call that the virtual metaverse. Uh, that's what a lot of people uh, immediately think about. 
But the metaverse is also layers of virtual content on the real world. I would call that the augmented metaverse. It's important to think about both because they have different regulatory requirements, different risks, but they can be brought together. In terms of how quickly this is going to happen, my personal view is that the virtual metaverse uh, will impact everybody's lives within the next 10 years. 10 years from now, most people will be spending a few hours a day in the metaverse uh, doing things like shopping and socializing, uh, entertainment. Uh, it will get increasingly more popular. People are not going to spend their entire day in the virtual metaverse. That said, I do believe that the augmented metaverse will greatly impact everybody's lives uh, over the next 10 years, meaning it will replace the mobile phone as our primary means of interacting with digital information. Uh, it'll start happening in the next two or three years, and by the early 2030s, uh, people will be walking down the street uh, with AR glasses. That's how they will interact. And in fact, they will look back at the time when people used to walk down the street staring down at a phone and think, that's ridiculous because the natural way to interact with information is to have it all around us. So the point is that this is going to happen. It's going to happen within the next 10 years. It's going to impact all of our lives. And so it's really important to think about regulation and think about regulation soon. So what are the risks? Uh, it's not the technology that I fear. It's the power that metaverse platforms will have over the lives of consumers. And that power is really significant if we go through it in detail. And it's actually useful to just take a step back and think about social media and the lessons learned from social media. Uh, and I say that because 20 years ago, we all thought of social media as this utopian technology. It's going to bring the world together. It's going to democratize society. And it really did do those things. At the same time, it evolved in a way that we would now consider more as a dystopia than a utopia. Uh, people realize now that social media has done some negative things. It's polarizing society. It's spreading misinformation. It's reducing trust in science and facts. It's reducing trust in institutions. And it's radicalizing populations. It's destructive to society. That wasn't the goal, but that's what happened. Don't take my word for it. Uh, at last year, the Aspen Institute ran, uh, conduct, uh, formed a panel and of experts and they studied this issue for six months, world experts. They wrote an 80-page report about the impact of social media. And what they concluded was really interesting, and this was uh, one of the most interesting quotes to me, which is that social media platforms wield an enormous influence on the public sphere, and their tools and algorithms facilitate and amplify disinformation and misinformation that are causing real societal harms. And so it's interesting to just look at this phrase, tools and algorithms. What are those tools and algorithms that are causing problems? Uh, I like to break it down into three categories, tracking users, targeting users, and monetizing users. Tracking users, social media platforms track where you click, what you buy, who your friends are. They basically profile you. And they profile you uh, very, very extensively. Why do they do that? They do that so that they can then target you. They target you with targeted ads, targeted news feeds, targeted content. In other words, they're influencing you. Why are they influencing you? They're influencing you because their business model is to monetize users, to sell access, to sell influence to third parties, to productize you. And so it's this cycle of the business model being to productize you that has driven social media companies to get better and better at profiling you and get better and better at influencing you. And this destructive cycle is why we are where we are with social media today. And so we can learn from that when we think about the metaverse. The metaverse risks are going to be similar to social media, but actually much worse. And I like to think of the risks in terms of three Ms of the metaverse. And I would describe those as mon monitoring users, manipulating users, and monetizing users. And these are very similar to social media. And they will have the same destructive cycle if we don't regulate social media before this gets built into the economics and ecosystems of platforms that are being built and launched. So let's just talk about monitor monitoring users. OK, social media tracks where you click, what you buy, who your friends are. What's going to happen in the metaverse? In the metaverse, platforms are going to track where you go, what you do, who you're with. 
And they're not just going to do this in virtual worlds. They're going to do this in the real world, within the augmented metaverse. You're going to be walking down the street. They're going to know where you are, what you're doing, tracking all that information in real time. In fact, they have to track that information in order to build the virtual worlds around you, to build the virtual experiences. They will also track where you look. You're walking down the street and you look in a window. They will know that. They will, in fact, know how long does your gaze linger on this window versus that window versus that window. They will track your gait when you slow down, when you speed up. They will have all that information throughout your entire day if you're wearing augmented reality glasses or throughout your entire experience in the virtual world. They will track your posture. Your posture implies emotion. Are you interested? Are you bored? They will track that. They will have access to that. They will monitor your facial expressions. Already companies are doing that so that they can have avatars that respond to your facial expressions, but they will have that information. They will monitor your vocal inflections. They will monitor your vital signs. And I tell that to people, uh, and they say, no, that's not going to happen. Well, first of all, it already is happening with smartwatches. People voluntarily allow monitoring of vital signs. Uh, those will be used not just for health things, but for lots of other applications. And there's numerous companies already building these capabilities into earbuds and headsets, monitoring vital signs. What kind of vital signs? They'll monitor your heart rate, they'll monitor your respiration rate, your blood pressure, your pupil dilation, your EEG. All of these things are happening. This will become commonplace in the metaverse. In other words, they will monitor your whole life. What you do, what you say, what you experience, and what you feel. That will happen, and if we don't regulate it, they can do whatever they want with that information. Yes, this is a privacy concern. It's easy to talk about the privacy issues, but this is actually much bigger than a privacy concern. Because what they will do with this information is then use it to manipulate users, influence, persuade. That will be the business model. So in social media, what they do is use this information for targeted advertising, targeted news feeds, targeted member invitations. In the metaverse, it's going to be different. Remember, the whole point of virtual reality and augmented reality is to fool the senses, to blur the boundaries between what's real and what's virtual. That means that advertising and propaganda in the metaverse will not be pop-up ads and promo videos. Advertising will be uh, the tools of persuasion will transition from flat media to immersive experiences, just like everything else in the metaverse. So what will that be? I see two major forms of advertising in the metaverse that will be very different than what we experience today. There will be virtual product placements and virtual people. Uh, virtual product placements will be targeted experiences that are injected into your world, promotional content that, uh, that platform providers will put into your world on behalf of the highest bidder. And that promotional content will be indistinguishable from authentic serendipitous encounters. What does that mean? It means if you're walking down the street in the metaverse, whether it's a real, a, a real world that's augmented or a virtual world, and you see you pass by a parked car, and you might think, oh, that's, uh, I've never seen that car before. You might keep walking, you see that car again. You might think you're just, oh, that's a new car that's popular in my community. And you might not realize, no, that was injected into your world by the platform provider on behalf of a third party sponsor. They've manipulated your world. Same thing, you could be walking down the street and see somebody drinking a Red Bull and walk and see somebody else drinking. And again, think that's just a normal part of your world, a serendipitous encounter. No, that was injected into your world. And so if we don't regulate this, you won't know what to trust and what not to trust. You won't know the difference between authentic content and targeted injected content. And it's not just going to be inanimate objects. In addition to you know, products, it could also be political propaganda. You might pass uh, political posters, political shirts, and not realize that they were injected into your world. And it will also be virtual people, AI avatars. There's two forms of them. There'll be passive avatars. You could be walking down the street and hear two people having a conversation about a product, a service, a political message, a piece of misinformation. You might think you're just hearing people in your world and not realize, no, those were injected into your world, targeting you specifically. Other people around you are seeing something different uh, in order to influence you or persuade you on behalf of a sponsor. There will also be active virtual people 
who engage you in promotional conversation. This will become one of the largest, most significant forms of advertising in the metaverse. You will be engaged by an avatar. They will engage you in promotional conversation. Uh, and they will be indistinguishable from authentic members of the world. You will not be able to tell the difference between a real person and an AI avatar in the metaverse. And they will have access to all that profile data that we talked about being collected. They'll know your history, your likes, your wants, your needs, your behaviors. They will have, those AI avatars will have access to that information when pitching you on products and services and ideas. And they will also be able to an analyze your emotions in real time because they'll have access to your facial expressions, vocal inflections, vital signs. If this is not regulated, they will be able to use all this information to pitch you. And in fact, I say that they will pitch you more skillfully than any used car salesman. Uh, and if you think about it this way, AI's systems right now can beat the world's best chess player, poker player, Go player. What chance do we have as consumers if an AI avatar engages us in conversation, has access to our history, our personality, our behaviors, our tendencies, is reading our emotions in real time, our facial expressions, our blood pressure, they will be able to adjust their tactics and manipulate us more skillfully than any form of technology we've yet encountered. People tell me, oh, we'll be able to tell the difference between a, a, a real person and a virtual person. We won't. Uh, there was a study that was just published a, a couple months ago uh, by Lancaster University and UC Berkeley where they did a study where they, where they had uh, people look at AI-generated faces versus real human faces. They tested it on hundreds of people, and people could not tell the difference. They were indistinguishable. And that was actually not the scary part of the study. The scary part of the study is that they then asked, they then asked people, which faces do you think are the most trustworthy? And people, by and large, said that the virtual AI-generated faces were more trustworthy than the real people. So what are advertisers going to use? They're going to use AI-generated faces, virtual spokespeople, because they're more trustworthy, and they're cheaper, and they're faster, and they're easier, and they'll have access to AI algorithms that can adjust in real time. This will happen. So what does it mean when we talk about regulating the metaverse? Well, uh, oh, well, I just talk for a moment about monetizing users. So in uh, social media, monetizing users is uh, targeted advertising. That's the revenue model. It, we have every reason to believe that metaverse platforms will follow a similar business model, targeted advertising. And in fact, this advertising business model, whether it's just part of the metaverse or the whole metaverse business model, is what drives this process of monitoring users and then drives uh, selling virtual product placements, virtual spokespeople, and, uh, and other promotional experiences. And so when we talk about uh, regulation, uh, it's worth pointing out one non-regulatory solution that would be very, very helpful to making the metaverse safer for consumers, and that would be to get rid of the advertising business model. And again, I want to say I don't blame social media companies for having adopted this, the advertising business model. They, they did that because consumers didn't want to pay in the early days of social media, and consumers preferred advertising. But hopefully we've learned our lesson, and maybe we would consider monthly subscriptions because if you, if you or other uh, business models, because if you don't have an advertising business model, there's less incentive to monitor users extensively, and therefore less, less incentive to hit people with virtual product placements and virtual spokespeople. So that's one path. Uh, I think it's uh, hard to predict that the world will go in that direction, which is why I think we need to really consider regulation of the metaverse. So again, for regulating the metaverse, let's think about regulating the monitoring of users. There's two types of monitoring. One is monitoring your experiences, where you go, what you do, what you look at, how long your gaze lingers. Well, I believe that there should be required transparency. Platforms should be need to, to need to reveal to users what is being tracked and when it's being tracked, and not through a click-through that they do when they first sign up. It should be revealed and obvious all of the time. They should be reminded if they're walking down the street and, uh, and they're being tracked what stores they look in, uh, what windows they gaze at, how long they should know that's being tracked. In addition, I believe there should be no profiling. Now, platforms need to have this information. They need to know what direction you're looking in order to, to build these virtual experiences. But they don't have to store this information. They don't have to store this information to profile you over time. 
And if they do store this information, then they will know everything about you. They'll know how you walk down the street every day, what stores you look at, what stores you don't. They will be able to build these behavioral profiles about you that are more extensive than anything we've ever seen. There should be no profiling. They will also monitor your reactions, facial expressions, vocal inflections, posture. Again, transparency. If the platforms are using AI to monitor facial expressions and vocal inflections and, and infer your emotions and your sentiments in real time, you should be informed that that's happening. And there should be no profiling. They shouldn't have to store this information and build up these emotional profiles. Otherwise, they will know exactly how you will react to every situation. They'll be watching you, 20, you know, all your waking hours every day, seeing how you react all the time, and they'll use that for advertising, for influencing, they shouldn't be allowed to build emotional profiles of you. And when it comes to tracking of vital signs, they should not be allowed to do that, uh, to, to store vital sign data and use vital sign data for anything that's not health related. I don't want advertisers to use my blood pressure or my respiration rate to optimize their pitch to me. And that will happen if it's not regulated. Then in terms of manipulating users, virtual product placements. There needs to be trans transparency. Platforms need to reveal when something is injected into your world by a paying third party. In fact, it should look different. If I'm walking down the street and I see somebody uh, drinking a Red Bull and then somebody else drinking a Red Bull, I, and if those aren't real people, if that's not a serendipitous experience but that was put there for me to see, it needs to look different. I need to know that, no, my community is not just suddenly all very into Red Bull or very into a particular p political candidate. Uh, I need to, I, it needs to look different. And the platform should need to reveal who the paying third party is. Who paid to put that into the, into the metaverse? When it comes to virtual people, AI-driven conversational agents, the platforms need to make it really clear but the difference between an authentic avatar and an AI agent that has an agenda when it engages me. They should look different. If I can't tell the difference between other members of the metaverse and AI agents that are engaging me in promotional conversation or AI agents that I'm just overhearing, then I will make uh, incorrect assessments of my world, my community. I, I will basically, they'll be using this blurred boundary between real and authentic to persuade me. They should look different. And if I'm engaged in a promotional conversation, I. I need to know that. I need to know I'm not just having a casual conversation with somebody, but that an AI agent is actually actively working to persuade me. I also believe that platforms have to reveal who paid to put that AI agent into the world. And we should ban the use of conversational agents that use your emotions, that are actually reading your facial expressions and blood pressure uh, while pitching you. So with all that said, after 30 years of working in this field, I really do believe the metaverse will happen. It will transform society over the next 10 years. There's all kinds of amazing, magical things that will happen. I bring up these dangers because I'm actually a, a real fan of what the metaverse can do. But if we don't do something, the problems will be similar but worse than today's social media. And we don't want to do what happened with social media, which was, you know, social media, it was unregulated, and by the time people realized that regulation was needed, it was too, too hard to undo because massive companies built up ecosystems and business models that relied on certain practices. We need to get ahead of it now and realize that the metaverse can be a magical, amazing place if it's regulated soon. So the time is now to regulate the metaverse, and the time is now to make it really clear to people that there are real dangers that are new and different, and we can do this right if we get on top of it. Thanks. Thank you so much. This was the best talk. This was so great. This is exactly why we're here today in this track, and your long view of the metaverse and what we need to do to make it a safer and way less scary place for future generations and for ourselves is absolutely what is needed. So I hope that even though there are just, um, you know, 
smaller numbers in our audience today that when this is up later um, and the recording is available that you please share this because I think this is absolutely incredible and important. And we have some questions. I also wanted to say there's a break now until 1040 and then we'll have our next speaker. So thank you. Hi, thank you for your talk. I think um, I work at Stanford, so I, I know about you. Uh, I've had conversations with young entrepreneurs, men and women, about the China um, where people have photographs, their, their emotions are controlled, and they actually have social credit scores, which determine what you can own, where you can live, if you can go to school. And I put the fear of God in them because I said, you do not want to go down these channels. So can you comment a little bit? I'd like to have it in your presentation and you know, keep working with you to, to get the message out. So this is the far end, here we are, let's find a balance. And also what as we as users and consumers can do to work with regulatory groups, you know, because the technology is way ahead of the laws. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, so really good questions. I've talked uh, mostly about this from a, a platform provider being corporations perspective, but similar issues come up if the platform providers are government actors. And so there are certainly parts of the world where these same things will happen but will be controlled by governments and, uh, and these same dangers exist and uh, potentially even, even worse. Um, as far as uh, working with regulators, working with uh, governments, I think it's really important uh, to educate politicians about what these dangers are and what, what the potential is for this to be worse than social media. And you know, we hear a lot, you know, a common thing that I hear is, oh, we haven't yet regulated social media, we, you know, we, we can't solve this. I actually think it's the opposite. Uh, social media has, uh, there's, there's a lot of similar problems, but social media is entrenched in a certain business model, entrenched in a certain ecosystem. It is harder to regulate social media. The metaverse is still in the formative stage, so it's actually easier to regulate. Now is the time to regulate. We should learn from social media. We shouldn't throw up our hands and say, well, we failed on that, so let's fail on this too. And, and you would be surprised. You, you hear that a lot. But educating uh, politicians is important. I've, I've talked to folks in uh, the Senate committee. I've talked to folks in the EU. I've talked to folks in other parts of the world. And the, you know, the, the people who will listen agree that most politicians really have no idea what's coming. And we need to educate all of them. I guess this is mine. Oh, there we go. Uh, thanks so much for the talk. Uh, another area that I think is, is really ripe for regulation is accessibility, because um, I know that's something where we've been playing catch up with a lot of the existing formats. And, and uh, it's right now is the potential to, to get some of this embedded from the get go. So um, what, what do you have in mind in terms of the ability to regulate accessibility and other positive practices and, and not just curbing the negative ones? Yeah, I mean, accessibility is, is a really important and really difficult issue in the metaverse. And so it's, it's great that people are pushing that and asking about that uh, because, you know, as we move, again, if the metaverse is this transition from flat media to immersive media and everything goes from 2D to 3D and everything becomes spatial, then these accessibility issues become even harder, bigger challenges for people who have, uh, especially if they have sensory deficits. Um, and what we need to do is just remind people, remind, remind platform providers, remind uh, your know, developers that these, the metaverse needs to be accessible to everybody. It needs to be accessible if you're blind, if you're deaf, uh, if you have mobility problems. And, um, and it's hard. Yeah, hey, uh, my name is Ruth. Thank you for this. It's terrifying, but very important. And good to name the details of where we could get better. Um, I was thinking as you were talking about how earlier and less and less, there's that concept of uncanny valley where we're just instinctually repulsed by, by something about the environment in that artificial reality. It feels like there's a different word that you're talking about here, which is the opposite polarity, where it's like an over-attraction to something that 
seems innocent or seems really real. Is there a word for that, or has anybody been trying to like say that as a polarity? So it's, I mean, you, this comparison to the uncanny valley is is like really interesting because with certainly with robots, uh, if they look a little not human, then people just they are repulsed by them. In the metaverse, with where uh, avatars and agents start to become cartoony, mm -hmm. then we actually are in a different place because mm -hmm. we've been raised since children to actually uh, gravitate yeah. to, to cartoon characters. Yeah. And so um, there's not this same uncanny valley. Uh, and, in, at the, and at the same time, the technology is advancing so quickly that it, it will not be long before these, uh, these avatars are photorealistic. Yeah. And, and so um, people are going to accept these avatars yeah. as people. And as the study I mentioned uh, said, yeah. the early research shows that we actually accept them as more trustworthy. Yeah. And I wonder how much that particular example had to do with the um, sacred geometry kind of piece of the face and how the algorithms are perfectly lined up so we feel a sense of predictability. So I'm, I'm sure it has something to do with the fact that an AI is building an aggregate face, yeah. a yeah. face that is you know, every man. Everybody right? likes and, that And so version, it appeals yeah. to us. Uh, the researchers didn't, didn't say why yeah. this was happening, but it is happening. Yeah. And I agree with your intuition that that's why yeah, it's happening. Yeah. But there's no word that you know of. And it'd be interesting yeah. that somebody starts to research that and say, like, how do we name this yep. as a protection? So thank yep. you. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, hi, Louie. I'm Chris. I've read a few of your articles, and uh, they really made me think. Um, so one of the things it seems like to me is that a lot of people that are going to fund the metaverse in terms of the hardware that's really needed in AR and VR are the same groups that right now are working off of advertising-based models. Um, and as you've shown, and it seems to me, this only gets better for those kinds of models, the real-time feedback loop that you've got to be able to keep generating things that work. So um, my concern is that by the time they get up and running with that, that uh, regulation will just be completely out of hand uh, because they have a lot of money and political power. And Any thoughts about things we can do now, maybe, that might slow that down? So I mean, I agree. If uh, if metaverse platforms rely on an advertising business model, then they will be motivated to get as good at persuading people as possible. And the, the tools of the metaverse, which blur the boundaries between what's real and what's, what's fictional, would be the most persuasive tools that we've ever seen. And so the best thing that could happen is uh, either for consumers to be willing to, to pay for subscription-based uh, based platforms where there is no advertising, uh, or just to, to demand no advertising. So if it, if it could bubble up from consumers, that would be great. The other is to push for regulation, and to push for regulation early, before these get built into the ecosystem. Because when a massive corporation uh, relies as their you know, core of their business model on advertising, then they're going to be incentivized to maximize their ability to profile people through tracking. And their ability in the metaverse is scary for profiling. And to maximize their ability to persuade people through these targeted immersive content, which is also terrifying. That said, if, if the government came in and regulated, I actually think the platform providers would, would appreciate it, because then they wouldn't end up in an arms race over tracking and, and targeting. They would, they would end up all being forced to, to have different business models. And, and I think they'd probably appreciate different business models. It's, I, again, I don't, I don't feel like you know, the social media companies set out to create this dystopian situation. People did not want to pay for subscriptions. And there was no regulations that stopped them from an advertising business model. And so it evolved organically the way it was going to evolve. And so regulation could actually be good for corporations, good for consumers, good for everybody, but it has to happen before the industry matures. Thank you. Thank you so much. Is there one more question? Okay. 
Last question. Thank you. Hi. Um, thank you so much for the talk. It was um, probably the best talk I saw um, this year uh, here oh, at uh, AW. Um, you talk a lot about regulation, but um, is there not also part of education to the people? Because maybe one of the issues with social media that appears is that usually in life, your parents just told you what you should do and what you don't, and how to deal with uh, the uh, difficulties of the life. But for the social media and internet, most of the parents that we had at that time were not aware of that, uh, of that uh, technology. They were blank. It will be probably the same for Metaverse. So should we have also some kind of uh, educational program um, coming from the, either the, um, uh, sorry, the, the organization or the countries to help people understand what are the risks? So, I mean, I agree. Education right now is one of the most important things. Uh, it's educating consumers and educating uh, politicians, governments. Uh, educating consumers, uh, I think, is important if, if you can see where this is going, if you can see that a metaverse, a metaverse platform will basically have the ability to watch what everybody's doing. It's, it's, you know, it's the most power that any company will ever have had. They'll be able to watch what everybody's doing in real time, who they're with, where they are, and potentially monitor facial expressions, vocal inflections. If consumers realize that, they'll demand something different, right? They'll demand something different, and, they'll, and, and if somebody offers a safe metaverse, a metaverse that doesn't do that, then that metaverse will get the user base. It's, it's when people don't think about it, they don't realize um, that you know, the level of tracking that will happen, that, um, that they'll just become users, and then they'll just accept the consequences, which is really, again, we can learn from social media. We can learn that we didn't know what the consequences were going to be. We didn't know how the business model was going to evolve. But we shouldn't get fooled twice, right? <laughs> Like this, like we can see this coming. We should educate people that we can see this coming. And if consumers demand a different type of metaverse, I, the, the corporations will appreciate that. They, they would be very happy to sell subscriptions for a safe metaverse. Uh, but consumers have to be willing to, to, to push for that direction. Thank you so much. I think we could all stay here all day and listen to you talk. And it's amazing. Thank you very, very much. Yeah.